Welcome back guys, I recently got back from my trip over to Aquarium Co-op. You probably saw the live stream on my channel if you didn't go check it out. There's also a bunch of other live streams on the other people who were there's channels. And it was just a lot of fun. I gotta say thank you to Corey and all the other guys to show up. I'll put links for everybody down in the description. And I have to give a huge shout out to Dorkula and Vicky for feeding us and keeping us alive through that, uh, that busy few days. So videos on all that stuff will be coming out sort of in a drip feed type of a way over the next couple of months and hopefully a little bit sooner than that so anyway guys I got back and we have more drama in the 33 not too bad though it could have been a lot worse but it prompted me to want to make this video about toxic gases that you have in your aquarium. So let's flip the camera around and talk about the first one, one of three. Before I left, we did a big trim here on the Glosso carpet that's in the 33. We left some of the back portion untrimmed to just kind of compare growth and see what happens. Now, before I left, my CO2, which is down here, had ran out. So if I wanted to keep my, you know, my tank healthy and keep things balanced, I needed to switch that CO2 out. I needed to change the CO2. I couldn't just leave it off for the whole time that I was gone because that could have been detrimental to my Glosso carpet that I've worked so hard for. And basically, this is what happened. So I changed it out, everything was looking good, and sure enough, there was a leak somewhere. So I come home and the tank, which is, there's two of them over here, but one of these tanks was completely drained, and luckily, nothing bad happened in the tank. Remember, we only have some Siamese algae eaters in here, and a bunch of a mono shrimp. You can see one hanging out right there. So luckily, nothing bad happened as a result of all of my tank draining, because I think what happened was it all drained out of the connection, okay? So it gassed off down here rather than gassing off in the tank. And if it would have gassed off in the tank, we could have seen a lot more problems because CO2 is a toxic gas. I mean, any molecule, any gas, any, any non-gas can have the potential to be toxic if it's in a high enough concentration, okay? And especially CO2 because the organisms in this tank require oxygen to live just like we do. And so when we put a ton of CO2 in our tank, Usually it's by accident, usually it's some type of malfunction. That can cause big problems in our tank. It can kill off all our fish. You know, if you've been working with CO2 and planted tanks for a long time, it's probably happened to you before. It's definitely happened to me where I accidentally gas a tank and all of my fish die. It's a horrible thing to go through and I don't wish it on anybody. There's a couple ways that you can have an accident with CO2 that leads to it being a deadly problem and I think one of the one of the ways that that can happen is basically you have a malfunction in this part right here. This is the valve that is telling the system how much CO2 should go up into your bubble counter. So you can see over here, you know, we have three, four bubbles a second, which is a lot, and we're running it through just one of these classic diffusers. They're not the best at diffusing CO2 into the aquarium, but if you have a problem where this malfunctions, the chances are you're not going to, well, you still can, but the, the chances of this causing all of your fish to die is a lot less likely than if you have a much more efficient inline diffuser, which completely mixes the CO2 in the water. So if this gets turned up way up, we're just gonna see a bunch of really big bubbles go up really fast and they're gonna gas off. And we pair that with you know good water circulation and some agitation up here from this pump, as well as you know a little bit from the HOB. I'm not convinced that I would have a huge problem in this tank. We surely could. I'm just hoping that I don't have to experience it. But that's sort of one way to protect yourself is to go with something that's a little less efficient at dissolving CO2. I know that sounds really kind of counterproductive and against what you're trying to do, but it's just one of those things that can help negate the trouble that you can have from something malfunctioning. The other thing is that if you're running a CO2 uh, setup without a solenoid, so this turns off at night, and that's really important because, remember, we're trying to balance an equilibrium between CO2 and oxygen. Our fish need oxygen, and our plants need the CO2 in a lot of cases. So we wanna be careful. It's something that you can easily mix up if you're new, and you just start dumping CO2 in here, and you don't have, you know, you're not promoting gas exchange up here at the top, you can run into some problems with your fish uh, suffocating. So we wanna turn this off at night because oxygen levels, even without adding CO2, get pretty low at night. And that's because our plants stop producing oxygen at night and they can actually consume 
a little bit of oxygen at night, okay? Because their metabolism changes and you know, you can run into some issues. You can run CO2 at night, but it's really kind of useless. And so we wanna conserve all the CO2. We don't wanna just like throw it into our tank all the time. If you are say using a DIY CO2 setup, you can't turn the CO2 off at night very easily. I mean, you could rig it in a way to do that, um, but if you are doing that and you're, you don't want to go the extra mile to, to pull the line out at night, then you can run an air stone at night. That's something that you can do. We don't necessarily want to run an air stone during the day when the CO2 is pumping into the tank because it's just counterproductive. We're increasing the aeration in the tank and thus reducing the ratio of CO2 to oxygen and helping to gas off more CO2 than we might want to have in our tank. So another way to make sure that your tank has enough oxygen at night to help prevent fish from um, basically suffocating is to run an air stone at night. Now, I don't do that. I know people that have done that and do do that. It's something that I don't think is 100% necessary, especially if you have a good grip on your system, but it's definitely something you can do to negate all the issues that can arise from running CO2. Another gas in the aquarium that can present problems, but I think is something that people shouldn't worry about as much, especially compared to when you're using CO2, is hydrogen sulfide. And so hydrogen sulfide H2S is a toxic gas that is produced when sulfate reducing bacteria use it as an electron acceptor, the same way that humans and our fish use oxygen. Okay, now this is probably most likely gonna happen down in your substrate where you have anaerobic conditions, meaning that there's no available oxygen for cellular respiration. So there are special bacteria, there's lots of different types that do it with different molecules, but they use these other compounds as a terminal electron acceptor. People with planted tanks tend to talk about this molecule more than any other type of hobbyist, and it's basically because when you use a planted tank, you're typically using a substrate that is either thick or contains a lot of organics. Now sulfate is present in a lot of different types of substrates, even ones that aren't nutrient rich, um, but are just anoxic. A scenario where hydrogen sulfide could be a problem is when you have a really thick substrate. Okay, so the thicker your substrate is, the more anaerobic areas you're gonna have. And that's where these bacteria are gonna thrive and end up producing that hydrogen sulfide gas that can be dangerous. Sulfates can enter the substrate through a lot of different ways. Either they're already there as a product of just having a lot of organics down there. When we use soil, there's definitely sulfur, sulfate, all kinds of different compounds down there that can lead to the generation of these type of bacteria that create hydrogen sulfide and thus potentially a problem. Even if you don't have organics down here, fish mulm waste can get down there and you're gonna end up having sulfates that can be converted into this gas. So hydrogen sulfide production can be a big problem in a tank, but it's something that I I've never really had an issue with. And I think that's the case because I always plant my tanks right away and get plants in there that have good root systems as quickly as possible, okay? I, like I said, I've done a lot of tanks with really thick substrates and it's never been a problem. And I think we owe it all to aquarium plant roots. And here's why. Aquarium plants, produce roots that go into anoxic areas. They need oxygen to stay alive. So what happens is your plants actually send oxygen down to their root system and create an oxygenated zone around their roots, or you know, we call this a rhizosphere, okay? So we have an area surrounding roots that has oxygen. Bacteria that use oxygen can go and live there and potentially provide some benefits to our plants. And this also protects them from an area where these bacteria that produce this hydrogen hydrogen sulfide gas live. Okay, so it's kind of like a micro area that protects these plants and it just basically oxygenates the soil around them, preventing these anoxic areas. So if we get down here and look, I mean, there aren't plant roots everywhere in this substrate, but you can see even way down here, having a thick carpet like this of these plants, we can see all these areas where these healthy roots are growing, that's all oxygenated. Maybe not, you know, down here in the in the middle here where you don't see any roots i mean these areas where these bacteria can live are really small but it is going to hinder their you know mass proliferation 
to the point where the production of this gas could be a problem. So that's why I say it's not something to really worry about. I think the only scenario where it could be a huge problem is if you set up a soil planted tank with a huge cap, you use a lot of soil and a lot of cover for that, and then you don't plant it for say, two or three weeks or maybe longer, okay? So then by the time you get in there and put plants in your tank, maybe your timing is just that way, then you already have pockets of hydrogen sulfide gas produced. Now, I'm not saying that's gonna happen all the time, I mean, everybody's tank is different. Every situation is different. It's not gonna be the same in every scenario. So just take that all with kind of a grain of salt. The last toxic gas that I wanna talk about in your aquarium is actually ammonia. So NH3 is a gas, and we know that it exists in an equilibrium with ammonium, NH4+. Okay, it's less toxic or maybe even non-toxic counterpart, however you wanna think about it. And that's a pH dependent relationship. So the lower the pH is, you're gonna have more NH4 plus than you have NH3. NH3 is really the toxic component here. It attacks fish's gills and it can damage them severely and of course kill them. So uh, knowing that, there are a few things to consider when we talk about nitrogen in the aquarium. I think the first thing to understand is that we probably always have ammonia and ammonium in our aquarium at all times. Just because we test on an API test kit and we get a zero reading doesn't mean there's zero nitrogen or that form of nitrogen in our aquarium. Those test kits don't really test down to uh, a very low level and I think it would be naive to assume that there is zero NH3, NH4 plus in our aquarium. Okay, the test kits are designed just to show, you know, this broad sort of toxic level to that's relative to fish. And so, you know, just because we don't have one ppm of visible ammonia doesn't mean we don't have, you know, 20 micromolar ammonium in our tank. And honestly, like we want to have a little bit of NH3 and NH4 in an equilibrium in our aquarium because our plants use that. It's the most efficient source of nitrogen for them, more so than nitrate, which is typically dosed in fertilizers. There's nothing wrong with adding nitrate to your tank, but just know that that ammonium form of nitrogen is always going to be um, easier for the plant to use. So we don't wanna you know, do anything crazy like dose ammonium in our tank. That can be a, I mean, you're just opening up a super dangerous Pandora's box when you do that. I've, I don't do that. Um, I know some experts do do that, but I, I would say that it's probably in tanks where they have very few fish and you know they have a lot of dilution. Because ammonia and ammonium are in this equilibrium, whenever you're running a planted tank, it's always nice to keep that aquarium a little on the acidic side. So pH 6, 6.5, I think is kind of the perfect pH for a lot of planted tanks because it's gonna help keep that ammonia in check, okay? Most of it is gonna be in the ammonium form, which is not really an issue for us and our fish. If your aquarium is say pH 8, Okay, and we have one ppm of ammonia in the tank. That one ppm is gonna be a lot more toxic than if the pH was back at that six, 6.5 level. And so just a thing to keep in mind, I mean, it's not something that you need to dwell over or be super concerned about. I think it's just a piece of information that everybody uh, should at least have. Anyway guys, I think that's gonna do it for today's video talking about the poisonous gases in the aquarium. There's certainly more than three, but these are just kind of the most relative ones that I could think of off the top of my head. If you like this video, getting a little bit more sciencey, let me know and I can certainly make a couple others that are like this and incorporate some of the more overlays and things like that. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new and check out everybody's channel from the weekend and be on the lookout for those new videos uh, from that really fun trip coming up soon. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you next time.